Thank you. <clears throat> so when we were doing sound check earlier, we had this clip playing, and um, I'm going to start it. This is um, this game came to market in 1972. Actually, November 29th. That was the day I was born. And I I do remember this when I got to be around two and a half, three years old. I do have visions of this when I was in my my parents' basement, my brothers were playing this. I have two older brothers and an older sister. And uh, so I've grown up with the, the, the idea that, and knowledge that you can control things on the television, you can make things move, you can animate you know, things that aren't real to a degree. And, and so this is obviously, I didn't really know this until recently, but this has obviously been a very influential for me. It's obviously paved the way for so much in technology and what's happening nowadays. And, and what's so beautiful about it is how simple it is. And it's a pretty fun game. I mean, you know, ping pong's pretty awesome by itself, but then, you, you know, here you go. You can do it on the TV set. Uh, so there it is, Pong. I, I think the guy on the left ends up winning that game, but I'll skip ahead. Uh, I'm mean, going to just let this play. There isn't any sound because it was an, a Super 8 camera that was uh, used to shoot all these home movies. Uh, I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark when I was, I don't know, six or five, somewhere around there, I forget. And, and I told my dad th after the movie was over that I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And um, he goes, an archaeologist? It's really not that much fun, really. <laughs> Archaeology is not, I mean, but no, I was like, no, Dad, I, I want to I make movies. I want to do that. I, don't, I, don't, I, I know that what's on the screen isn't real, but it's really cool, and it's fun to bring that to life, and I want to figure that out. And so um, a couple of other films had come out, like, around the time, like, Empire Strikes Back was very, it was, it was so huge for me, and it's because of my... My babysitter at the time was this librarian, and she would take care of me when my parents were out, and, and she had a Betamax player. And one of the early Betamax tapes that came with sometimes with a, a player was the uh, Empire Strikes Back making of. And I would watch that constantly, just over and over and over again. And, and seeing the blue screen and the stop motion ad ats and how they were doing all of that with the giant motion control cameras was really just like, I don't know. It just was, was feeding all of this stuff that happens now uh, for, not just for me, but for, I think, for a lot of people. You know, you've got DVD extras, and, and DVD extras are, are like film school, really. I mean, for me, and I wish I had had more of that. I'm going to jump ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go from, like, being, like, a little kid to graduating from college. And, and shortly after graduating from art school, I um, hooked up with some friends from high school and back in Fort Worth and in Dallas and we started to form this company called Real Effects and we did uh, all sorts of cool stuff for commercials and entertainment and uh, along the way early on we there was a these commercials that were really great these Listerine commercials and a company that was making them was also starting to develop a, a movie about toys and I uh, remember saying one day he's like yeah that's that's what we want to do right I mean that's the thing and um, uh, how do we do that? It's like, well, you know, they did the short, they got some recognition for that, one thing led to another. So it's like, well, why can't we do that? And sort of this, this sort of silly thought, you know, I guess in hindsight it was pretty ridiculous because, you know, you're, you're not necessarily, we weren't necessarily on the West Coast or East Coast, we didn't necessarily have all the technology, but we still thought that we could pull it off. And so I, I don't know, um, there was a moment of reflection and just trying to figure out, well, well, what are we missing? Well, story, obviously, was one major thing. I went to school for, you know, art. I didn't necessarily focus on storytelling. And I knew that that was a, a weaker spot for me personally, and I was, like, going to my favorite section at a Barnes & Noble, which is the children's book section, because, you know, it's all my favorite illustrators and all their books and all their great stories. And I picked up a book, and I was like, you know, oh, yeah, Dinosaur Bob. I remember getting this in high school. So I was looking at it, and then I grabbed another book right next to it, and it was the William Joyce scrapbook. And I started looking through that, and then on the last page, there was, a, there was an illustration of the man in the moon. And uh, it's like, wow, and this is a story that has yet to be, you know, realized by William, and I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then I did a little research, and it was like, wow, he's just down the street. He's in Shreveport. 
It's like he went to SMU. Like I was making all these connections, so I was like, well, I'll have to, I have to reach out to this guy. And so I did, and then one thing led to another through a, I guess, a fan letter to end all fan letters. There was lasers and dry ice. It was sort of like a big bat signal. Come play with us in Dallas. And then eventually <laughs> it, that, that happened, and Bill drove over, and uh, Elizabeth at the time was like, where are you going? Why are you going there? I mean, we went to college. Like, What's there now? I mean, really? And uh, he, he came over, and when he met me at the door, um, he, was, he, he, he tells the story of how he thought, you know, all of a sudden he showed up at like daycare and he was wondering where our parents were. And he really literally did think that my mom had dropped me off at the office. Was, but we got into it, we started playing around and with this idea of telling the origin story for the man in the moon. And uh, we knew that we couldn't technologically at the time build all this organic stuff in the computer. So we thought, well, we like working with our hands. Maybe we can like build it with our hands. And so we went about building these miniatures for the lunar landscape, which is a component of our short. And uh, we thought, you know, maybe we can do the CG animation of just the characters and composite them in. So one thing led to another, and we created the short. And uh, for a few years, it sort of sat around because we never got to really finish it. And it never went into film festivals. You know, one thing leads to another. You, you run out of money, and you run out of time. You've got to go back to what pays the bills. And so. Uh, it did open doors, however. We, we were able to get the VHS <laughs> into the right hands, and, and, it, and, it, and it sort of traveled. And eventually, it made its way to Katzenberg, and one thing led to another, and then we had this, um, this whole movie deal, uh, turning not just the origin story of The Man in the Moon into a film, but the whole idea of the Guardians of Childhood, which uh, had this whole larger scope to it, and I'll get into that later. But I don't know if you noticed, but there was a little lunar landscape there of a, a little guy, uh, and it was sort of shaped like this. And that's the Moonbot, and the Moonbots are the caretakers to the man in the moon. And it sort of is, has become our sort of uh, Mickey, our Mickey Mouse, if you will. So for, for many years past, and I'm talking about an entire decade, um, where we'd, we'd always wanted for the short to pave the way for us as filmmakers to be able to start doing other things. And as you know, journeys um, or your, your, your goal that you have never goes in a straight line. And it certainly didn't for us. You know, the dot com happened. What if it was a website and we'd go over here for a few years? No, nah, that's a bad idea. You can't make money. And then you go over here and something else happens. This guy wants to make it a show, a TV show. Well, you know, it, it all sounds great, and, and they're all, you know, you learn something from all of those things. And one of those things, and I'll, I'll come to it in a minute, but we eventually were able to form our studio, Moonbot, through um, one thing leading to another. And it was sort of like the perfect storm for us, and in the sense that myself and my other partners, William and Lambton, Enox, the, the sort of the, the, the third person that sort of rounds out the trifecta and makes it work. He's the guy that um, he calls himself the wheels on the bus. And, and, and that's one thing I told Bill early on. I said, if we were going to start a new studio and try to do it our way, um, if it were up to us, we would totally run the company into the ground. People could give us money, we could do stuff with it, and then it's just all over with. It's sort of like, <laughs> I've seen it happen before. There was a company that the Beatles put together called Apple. There was a company that, um, even after that, that George Harrison put together called Handmade Films. There was another company that Chaplin put together called U uh, United Artists. When a company is driven by creative individuals, it's cool for a while, and then you run out of money. We can't let that happen. But when I met Lampton and, and Bill introduced me to him, I was like, OK, he legitimizes this effort. Maybe it'll work. <laughs> um, Actually, I, I actually felt confident that it would work, having, having met him. So we dove head first, and the opportunity arose to be able to do it, we thought, from the first back in 1998. Why don't we start with a short, get it out to the world, use it as a calling card, and if, if, if things work out well, maybe, just maybe, it'll get into some film festivals, and if they're in the right film festivals, they'll win certain accolades that allow us access to maybe get nominated for an Oscar. So Bill pulled out this sketch that had been done on a little piece of paper that he had drawn on when he was going to visit his publishing mentor, Bill Morris, who had taken care of not only him, but um, hundreds of authors over the last few decades for um, his publishing company at the time, HarperCollins, which was before that was called 
Harper Brothers. And so Bill Morris um, thought this was a beautiful story. It was a little analogy, but it was this little idea. And it sat on the shelf. Like many great ideas, they don't just really come out immediately. And this one had to marinate for a while, and things had to happen, like Katrina. And, and I'm going to come around to that, because Lampton relocated to Shreveport because of that storm. Other things happened, too, because of that storm. There were many people in shelters all over. And, and William saw many children in these shelters and how the, the, everything had been stripped from them, no privacy, nothing. Yet, uh, books that were donated through Reading is Fundamental, I believe, in first book, the, the children at least had that. They at least had a, a book. And when you open a book, you, you, it's as simple as that, but you can be immersed in a story and you have like this cone of silence over you. You are, you are there and nothing else matters. You are sucked in. And, and the power of a story is, is incredible, actually, if you start to think about it. It's, it's, it's a, it can be curative. And so these, these little observations all start to build together into like what we've called a gumbo. And, and then for us and the, the development of this first story, we threw in everything we loved in cinema as well. We threw in, and you'll see in some of the artwork here, the development artwork from the storyboards to the character design. Obviously, we love Buster Keaton movies. And we thought, well, if we're going to have to invent a movie star, what better uh, reference than uh, Buster, and the reason why we chose Buster is he's, he, we're throwing this character in a very flappable sort of world, yet he's unflappable, and that's what was important is that you, you saw that in his expressions and the fact that we chose not to do any dialogue. So Joe Bloom, our lead artist at Moonbot, was able to sort of take everything we loved about uh, Morris, I'm sorry, Buster Keaton, and, and evolve him into our Morris character for our short, and he did all these poses. These are all very important for all the rigging and design of the character when it comes to 3D. And uh, Bowden Sayer, our lead TD at Moonbot, who we hired on as soon as we could get him right out of school, came on board. And, and uh, he's, he's, you always need a bow. You always need um, what we call um, a bow, but a, a, a genius. Because <laughs> technically, we, we, we had incredible sort of what a lot of people would call impossible hurdles to climb or jump. And, and Bo being right out of school, that worked to our advantage. He, hadn't, he, didn't, he didn't know any better that, that these things were, in, these were impossible. These were impossible tasks we were giving him. And, and so, um, you know, like, well, we need a book that you know, looks like it has thousands of pages, but it's really only four, so it doesn't crash the computers. Or, or you know, um, and then this is some, some imagery here of uh, all the various things that go into creating the short. A lot of artwork that nobody has really seen unless you went to the art space and saw the exhibit. Some beautiful uh, color scripting here by Joe Bloom as well. We also wanted to build miniatures just like we had done back in 1998. Here's a, one of my favorite clips that never made it into the short, but this is this, the back plate. And a little tiny piece of it is used, but in its entirety, it's, I don't know, it's just really beautiful. It allows you to see all the hard work that went into the construction of those three blocks, which flies by within the first 60 seconds of our 17-minute short. <laughs> this, these were some of the original sketches, and this is how you know, we, re, we interpreted these sketches with the miniatures that Jim Hayes and Christina Cox and all the crew um, at uh, LA House of Props here locally constructed for us. And uh, a lot of uh, flotsam, obviously, that we brought to the table from our own personal libraries. I mean, I'm talking about personal libraries, like little books, like the little golden books. But then um, eventually we dressed it out and added the characters and adjusted lighting. And, and, and there's sort of what, how it all looks when it's all put together. When we were on set, we used the iPhone and, you know, hadn't been out for very long. And we used it in our production. And it's been an invaluable tool, not just um, the iPhone, but now the iPad. But when we were doing this, the iPad was, was announced, actually, while we were on set. And this was our reaction. <laughs> and when we finally got our hands on it, this was sort of how we felt. <laughs> and, and, and it was this device and this toy that we'd always hoped to be able to have, but we didn't know we wanted it. And then Whoa. this was sort of, when we finally got our hands on it, this yep, is how we reacted. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Now that, that's an Apple II, and, and my best friend growing up uh, ran a lemonade stand in Fort Worth. 
and he had, he had the sweetest spot. It's all about location. And he raised enough money to buy himself one of these computers back when it first came out. And we had a blast, and we, we had that reaction, and I felt like I remembered this from Sesame Street back then. And um, I, you know, obviously it was really important to be able to sort of capture the essence here is how we felt when we got our hands on this technology. All right, so I'm sort of giving you a, a journey, uh, our path and, that we've gone on over the last two and a half years at Moonbot. Our short film had a 5,000 to 1 odd after we um, got it into the world. And uh, not only did we get it into the world through a short, but the iPad allowed us to re-envision how we wanted to create something different. And so we took the assets and repurposed them with our friends at Twin Engine. And we were able to, through uh, uh, fast start with the state, be able to get some workforce training funds to be able to start to build our own interactive. But uh, it was the craziest thing. Once we had accomplished creating this interactive story app for Morris Lessmore, we pushed a button in our offices. And then within, within a few hours, it was out to the world. And then within a few days, we got emails from people all over the, all over the planet. Uh, there was a doctor, I remember specifically, in India, and he had a grandchild, and he sent a picture of him with the grandchild on his lap playing with our app and saying how this was an, an amazing experience, how it was bridging these generations, and the two of them were able to experience the story, and it was an experience that they had never had before. And this sort of story has repeated itself over the past two years now. But that was, uh, it, it became bigger than we had Imagine, but we did move quickly, and we knew that we had a feeling that we, we needed to get it out there quicker than um, our, uh, our, our, our agent was advising or our publisher was advising. They thought, you know, you, know, you don't know how you should price this. You should wait and let's just see how the market goes. But we just felt, you know, we got to get it out there. And that's paid off for us. Uh, many of you have probably already seen this. This was the trailer for the app we created. Calvin, who's here, edited this together, taking a lot of the existing assets from the short. After this got into the world, um, this, this happened. A few months went by and we were like, well, you know, there's a couple people downloading it. And then there was this spike that happened literally overnight when Fast Company Design said something nice about us. <laughs> and and uh, it literally made our servers crash and our IT guy came rushing in, Steve Macovius, and he thought they were on fire. And he's like, what is happening? I was on vacation at the time and my... And, and my wife was like, why are you always on your phone? I was like, you don't understand. I don't know what is going on. It's just all of this, like my Google alerts were just going through the roof. And, and so this happened, but it was only for a day, really. But it's still pretty cool to think that a book uh, was number one over Angry Birds. Other things happened. And there, were, there was this quote that happened in, in the Times in the UK, which is, uh, it's more than flattering. It's like, yeah, I don't know, it's like you've, you've been run over by a steamroller after somebody says something like this. And so this made us feel like this. <laughs> but here you, you see where it's all led for us, all those laurels, the, the, the brassy Hall of Fame thing that you get in the app store and then the magazine that claims that you're the best app of that year goes to your head. But at the same time, you know, we're moving along towards this event called the Oscars, and we've been narrowed down to this 250 number, where they've, they've narrowed it down to a degree. These are the ones that have won other festivals that are in contention. Now, other things have happened along the way where, uh, you know, we're cross-species 
uh, on our uh, on our fan base now, where this is on our fa on our Facebook page for many weeks without anyone truly noticing what it was saying. But it was I think my my orangutans really like your app. No one read that. It was on there for a long time. I went through. That. I was like, what? It's, and then I call the guy up, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, Mahala really loves Morris. Of all the apps, Mahala really loves this. So I was like, wow, that's cool. So that became its own story. I got, I got picked up. That was on the news. I think MSNBC picked that one up. So uh, we come to our, our sophomore effort. You, you do really well right out of the gate. It's cool, but it's also like, crap, where do you go from here? And so. We decided, well, um, well, and the catalyst for this came through a phone call. Apple called and said, it was like, you know, four months till December, and they were like, well, what are you guys doing for the holidays? And we're like, well, that's, well, I'm going to my in-laws, what do you mean? <laughs> what? And, and he's like, no, 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 no. Uh, what, are you guys going to double down on Morris? Are you going to do an update, something holiday related, or are you going to do a new app? People are wanting to know. You're, you're not just you know making one app, are you? And we're like, no, of course not. We're yeah, we're 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 building our own interactive division, and uh, sure. So what do we do? But it's like we only have four months, and uh, the the more Celeste more app took a lot longer. Obviously, there were assets that were in this app that took a year to create. So how are we going to do that? It's like well, we started to look at our slate of IP, and there wasn't one thing in our slate that seemed simple enough to pull off. But then we came to this drawing, again, this one drawing of Bill's, it was of the letter A with these little guys climbing on it. And it was this idea of what if the alphabet were invented by these little creatures? So then we started to throw it around and I believe within maybe an hour or two, we decided we were going to make this and we were going to go for it. And we just dove head first and uh, we thought, you know, we can reference other things that we love. We had just seen, it had come to the Robinson Film Center, the Metropolis, the, 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 the cut that actually had all the footage in it, that, so where the story actually made sense. And, and, and we were blown away by this, not just because of how, how amazing the story was, but also how beautiful everything was in the film. And we, it reminded us of everything we loved about abstract German expressionism. We thought, well, maybe we can make that appealing to kids. And so, so, we, 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 we attempted this, and, and, and then over a, a course of a few months after it coming out to the world, it, 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 it gets the recognition of a Webby Award. And here's some of the artwork that went into this. But the, the, the a Webby Award that we were nominated for was Best Entertainment App, and we were up against uh, PBS, HBO Go, The Onion, um, when we were up against ourselves, Morris Lessmore. <laughs> so that was, that was a trip. So there you go. And, and here's the trailer. If you haven't seen it, I don't know if have, have any of you guys seen the Numberlies app? Have you heard about it? You, okay, a few of you. I'm, I'll play the trailer. It's pretty short. Um, but here's a peek at the trailer. And the majority of this epic sort of scope is really just done with some you know, layered PSDs, uh, Photoshop paintings. And you know, we chose simple designs for our characters so that we could turn them around quickly. And we chose black and white, obviously, because you know, a good chunk of the time is spent on color and, and lighting. And uh, it allowed us to turn this around in four months. So, the best thing out of creating this app was just this experience. I believe Nolan, who's here, shot this. Is your nephew or friend's kid or something? All right, so check this out. This is why we made it. And turn up the volume just a little bit so you can hear this. You did it, man. Did I do it? You did it. B! <laughs> B! 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 <laughs> I don't know, man. It's like, it's so great. It's like, the, the, and people ask, like, okay, did you have focus groups? Did you have children come in and play with this app to know that they would react this way with Morris and with Numberlies? I'm like, actually, no, not really. We didn't have the time for that, nor, you know, you know, most of our employees, they don't have children. And so, you know, the, the few kids that we have around the office are rarely there because, you know, we're all very busy with our lives and we have to do this quickly. But I think the reason why maybe, I'm just, this is a theory, why, 
kids like this stuff is because we're kids. Um, the, the people that work at Moonbot are children, and um, that, that's good. <laughs> It's good and bad, but no, it's mostly good. It's really good, actually. And, and, and so it's all about balancing that. All right, so along our journey here, uh, we, we get narrowed down to this top 10 list. But you know, 10 people aren't nominated. It gets narrowed down. And, and it's the most strenuous and painful uh, month of your life when you find out that you're in the top 10. And then a month later, you're going to find out if you're nominated or not. So, I'm going to show you the clip. This was, this was our, everybody at Moonbot gathering together for breakfast one morning because what happens is on the West Coast, they announce at, I don't know, 5 a.m. over there so that the people in New York can find out at a reasonable hour so it gets a lot of press during the morning shows. But the thing is, they only announce the top 10, you know, best actress, director, best picture. The others, those short films and, you know, best uh, documentary are, are announced uh, through a press release that's released digitally. So what you have to do is hit refresh over and over again on, on the website to see if the PDF shows up. And there, we popped up and we're scrolling down. We're scrolling down. All right, so now the odds are five to one. <laughs> I, I, I can't watch that clip too long because I get emotional and it's, um, it's a big deal. So the thing is, that's cool and all, but there's this other company who's got a short in the five. <laughs> and they, they've, known, they've been known to win these things. And um, like I was mentioning earlier, back in 1994 or three or two, whenever it was with the lamp. So we felt about this big in comparison. <laughs> But, okay, so oh yeah, let me explain one thing. The, the, this one thing happened that day when that announcement happened. There was a, a reporter, a film critic in Dallas that called up and said, hey, Brandon, you remember? Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, Robert, yeah, what's going? And then he's like, congratulations, that's awesome. And then I have one question after this interview. Uh, last question was, like, who are you wearing? And I'm like, what do you mean? What, what is it? And he's like, no, you know, like, you have to wear this thing. You, you get a designer. I'm like, oh, sure, right, well. Um, I don't really know any designers. Uh, you know, I grew up in Fort Worth. He's like, well, wait a second. There's there's a designer in Fort Worth. It's uh, there's Dickies, right? <laughs> and uh, and that was just sort of mentioned, kind of on the fly like that. And then this story posts a few hours later, and then within another hour, Dickies has seen this and their Google alerts, and they call up and they said, we would love to outfit you guys. <laughs> and so I'm like, are you serious? Because I will, we will take you up on that. <laughs> And, but you know, I don't know if I'm gonna wear overalls though. <laughs> so can you make tuxedos? Yes, we can. So we, we met with them, they sent over a tailor, but we're like, we have to make this something special about this. It has to be like a Dickies thing. And so we chose this interior orange, uh, high visibility lining. And uh, we went with that and yeah, it worked out great. So uh, I'm gonna show you this little clip here. And the Oscar goes to? Fantastic flying books of Mr. Morris Lesmore, William Joyce, and Brandon Oldenburg. Thank you! <laughs> That's a Maryland's place. It was it was so bittersweet to win because that's where we wanted to be, was with all those guys. Alright, so <laughs> the people go, well, how are the apps selling? And then, well, they did jump. They jumped quite a bit. And, and obviously that helps to get, you know, billions of people watching you go up on a stage and say thank you. And they go, what is this fantastic flying books? And then they'll, they end up at iTunes and then they're downloading your app. Uh, I had the trophy with me and we had a meeting at Sony in London and I, for some reason, we. We, I don't know why we scheduled it this way, but uh, we had to be on a plane the following morning to London. And so I carried it with me and um, I, I, you know, we went there and it was fun to take through security and all of that. <laughs> and to, on the plane, you, you get champagne apparently when you have one of those with you when you go on a plane. It's pretty, pretty rad. But you know, uh, we don't want to be that weird guy two years from now with, on our bicycles in Shreveport with it strapped to the front and say, hey, check it out, we got the, 
no, you know what that. So we, we, only, we know we can only milk it for a couple more months and then it's over. But uh, that week after that trip and returning home, um, uh, Bill said, hey dude, there's like this parade they're doing. <laughs> And so literally that following morning, I, I um, got out of bed and went straight downtown. I hadn't seen the crew yet. When I saw everybody, they were on the float. But here's a little clip from it. Apparently they haven't thrown a parade like this downtown since DJ did. And that, we've, we've been hiring a lot of people recently and one of the challenges is to answer the question in the past, it's always been a challenge to answer the question, well, why are you doing this in Shreveport? Why Shreveport? Well, now we just show them this clip. That's why we do it in Shreveport. <laughs> what other, uh, you know, Oscar recipient returns home to something like this? And this we, are, we were able to pull off everything that you've seen so far this evening because we did it here. And so, Eventually, this book comes out a few uh, months ago. We, it was actually only, it was only supposed to be a book. And eventually we were able to like, go back to what it was supposed to be and make the book and get it out. But through this um, amazing opportunity, we've been able to create an imprint with Simon Schuster. And so this is Moonbot's book, uh, the, uh, Moonbot's first book. And of course, we just can't just do a book. We have to do something else. And so we decided that we wanted to make a companion app for the book. Now, another really cool thing is this book's been out for 10 weeks or so, and it's been on the New York Times bestseller list for well, 10, nine weeks. That's pretty rad. Uh, again, it comes back to like, what is happening? You get the best app, you get the, the thing, and then the, wow, it's incredible just the way people have been embracing this story. And hopefully they'll embrace our company after this story has run its course. So the Imagitron app, I want to give you all a peek at um, what this is all about. Here's, like, when you launch the app, this happens. So Imagitron is, <laughs> there's an instructional video, I'll play a little bit. Congratulations, you're the proud new owner of Moonbot Studios Imagine Imagine no now with Storioscope. Are you ready? Here's how it works. Okay, let's begin. First, make sure the pages are always nice and flat. Good. It's important to have a well-lit room. Whoa, that's too bright. Ah, much better. Now, make sure to avoid those nasty glares. Nice! Once you've activated the Imaginotron app, line up the corner guides on the screen with the corners of the pages of your book. Perfect! <laughs> it seems like alchemy, but trust us, it's only proprietary Moonbot technology. No witchcraft here. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little more about that. So w alchemy, witchcraft, all of that. Uh, it is really weird. Um, this augmented reality, a lot of you heard about this technology. It's been around for a little while. But now you're able to target imagery versus little like X's and squares. And I showed this to my mom. And it was, it was really hard to grasp. It was like, what is happening? This is really weird. And she was holding the app. Or the, I'm sorry, the iPad like this, and there's a point where it says, look up, and she does this. And I'm like, no, 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 no you got to do this with the, the thing. And, and she's like, how is this working? Are you putting microchips in the paper? How, how? And it's like, no, it just sees the image. The, the, and Nolan could get into this afterwards, just ask some questions and explain technically how it happened. But, but basically, the, the app activates this magic, and in, things come to life. So, we got to play with this technology early on, and we're like, wow, this is just so great. This is, like, this, is, this is like the future happening right before our eyes. We're living in Buck Roger times. We're able to pull this stuff off. It's as close as we're, we feel like we're going to get to a hologram for at least another four decades. So we do this, and um, we, we 
we, I want to demo it for you tonight, but it's tricky, you know, to run cables and do all this or go air, and so it's just easier just to shoot a, a quick video and show you how it works. But when you lift up the iPad in front of the, let's say, the cover, your book sprouts legs and arms and invites you to open them up. And then from that point on, every page, every illustration has some sort of magic that happens. And here's another uh, clip, um, for example, like this one. There's fall. There's Morris reading under the tree during the fall. Lift up the iPad, and the leaves are falling off the tree. And you do that again for winter. There's snow, and then the other parts where there's books flying and all of this other stuff happens. So books are really important to us. Books for us aren't, they, they are not merch. They're not like the thing that you do after you release a movie. That to us, it's sort of the box set. It's sort of like the pentacle sort of goal for us is the, the story is what's king, right? And the book is the most purest form of that story outside of just verbally telling it to someone. So we're building a box set with our studio. And outside of Morris, there were other books that we'd always planned. Um, for example, going back to the history, back in 98 when we were developing this origin story for the man in the moon and all these other guardians and how they all know each other and work together, we were thinking, wow, wouldn't it be cool to have a whole publishing series uh, the whole program that were like young readers, picture books that gave you the origins of these characters. Wouldn't it be cool if those books came out before a movie so it doesn't feel like merch, it doesn't look like it, it shouldn't be. It should be classic feeling stories. And so these are the books that have been completed so far in this series. And we've been fortunate enough to have been able to, back when the deal was made through uh, the other studio and with Bill, to be able to retain those rights to be able to get these out before the film. And so now I'm coming kind of full circle. In a couple of days, on November 21st, this movie comes out. And obviously, for myself it, and for Bill, it's been a long journey. I remember meeting Bill and his kids for the first time. And Jack was this tall, and Mary Catherine was this big. Now I have two children. Uh, Riley is this tall, and Zoe is this big. So it's been a while, but um, it's it's, the story and the catalyst for this story came from Bill and his daughter. His daughter asked him one day, it's like, I don't know if it was tooth, the tooth had, fairy had just come and given a tooth, but she, she was making a connection. Well, does the tooth fairy know Santa Claus? And how do they know each other? And, and Bill was like, well, of course they know each other. Well, let me think about this. <laughs> and there you go. And uh, just the other day, the guys who are the maintenance guys in our building uh, we had this box arrive from DreamWorks, and we said, can you help us put this together? <laughs> and uh, if you go to, like, let's say, Tinseltown, you'll see this in the hallway. And when we saw it, it, it all became very real. And it's cool to be able to have this up in our offices now. So uh, to recap, Moonbot in our studio, and what we're trying to do is always, uh, you know, the books I was telling you about, but also to be innovative. It, that's, I think, the critical com uh, component for everything we do. Um, we don't want to be reactive to the market. We don't want to go like, hey, uh, Barney, that's cool. Let's make a Barney like them, because that Barney thing was successful. It's like, no, let's do something different. Let's, you know, think of something different. I think that's going to be better. And um, we're interested in other things besides just movies. You know, a lot of people go, oh, you're an animation studio. You're going to make movies, right? You're going to start making movies. Yeah, we, we are, but we've watched a lot of studios crash and burn with the stars in their eyes. Yes, we want to make a movie. And the problem is they'll, they'll get to making that movie, and then the, the studio goes, great, awesome job. Now what are you going to do? You've got 250 employees. Oh, crap. Uh, yeah, what about the other film? Oh, it's not ready. See you guys, sorry, I'll let you all go. We don't want to do that. So it's going to take us some time to be methodical to get all of our stories in a good place to where we can start to roll from one to the next. And for us, in the way that we think like children, uh, we want to be gratified and, and quickly. And we want to just dive headfirst into a movie. So it's, it's taking some discipline uh, and patience right now. So I'm coming full circle here. Uh, obviously, we love stage productions, and we want to do that. Um, it's the desire to get an EGOT, maybe. I don't know, the Emmy, Grammy, Tony thing. Maybe, maybe one day we can come full circle and do the Tony thing. But um, I want to show you just two little clips, to sort of sneak peeks at what we're doing next. Uh, Bowden shot this on his iPhone. 
that's a little guy we call Oz, and we want to be able to tell his story for you guys. And one day, this story is going to come out into the world through a, a theatrical experience that's not like your traditional theatrical experience. You will, you will go into this story. And we're really excited, and we're going to, we've, we're, we've already started development on that story. and We've been working on it for over a year and a half. And then the other thing, which is really exciting to kind of just tell you guys about, but before the end of this year, we're going to launch a Kickstarter. And it's going to um, be all about this guy, a golem, and uh, the origins of basically Frankenstein. Uh, the golem is, uh, was the first Frankenstein story. And we're going to make this into a large platform video game. And it's, it's going to be all about emotions and, and storytelling. And we're, we're, we're hoping that, and I'm quoting other people that have said this before, but we're hoping that this video game will tap into other emotions besides adrenaline and uh, just blowing stuff up. And this development that goes into this game and the development that goes into the stage production, it's all a way for us to monetize our story development before we end up making them into movies. And we hope to continue to go into other mediums as well. So that pretty much rounds it out. Thanks for your, your time.